So last time we last time we classified we finished the classification of the finite coxeter groups. And today my plan is to <coughs> conclude this class basically by applying that towards the classification of the regular polytopes. And I'm sure you're all familiar to this to some extent. Um, for example, you know that in dimension two, this is not a very interesting question. If you want to uh, classify the regular polygons, well, they're either regular tri triangle, regular square, regular pentagon, etc. One for each number of side lengths. And one that you might not be inclined to include, but we need to include it, is the segment. Well, I guess the debatable thing is whether this is really two-dimensional. Uh, I guess really it isn't. So maybe I shouldn't include it in two dimensions, but in one dimension. Okay. In three dimensions, I'm sure you're familiar with this, there's the five platonic solids. So there's the regular tetrahedron, the regular cube, the regular octahedron, and I'll stop with my pictures there. <laughs> Dodecahedron and icosahedron. Okay. These are the five platonic solids, and I'm sure you've heard that these are the reg only regular polytopes in three dimensions, but maybe you don't know why. And so this is one thing that we will prove today, is that that's it. But we don't want to stop there. Why, why stop there? And so really we're going to continue this dimension four, five, et cetera. I really want to classify all the regular polytopes in all dimensions. That's the plan. Okay. So first I should define for you what I mean by this. So let's say that P is some n-dimensional polytope. Okay. So I should tell you what I mean by a regular polytope, and the way I'll do it is in the following way. First let me define what a flag is. So a flag is going to be a sequence. We already saw flags before in a slightly different context. So it's going to be a sequence of faces where you start with some vertex of the, of the polytope. Then you go to some edge. Then you go to some two-dimensional face. And uh, if you're in three dimensions, then you might stop there. But if you're in more dimensions, then you need to go to the three-dimensional faces, four-dimensional faces, etc. By the way, I, I should let you know that if you are used to thinking about polytopes in more dimensions, and I will talk about polytopes of more dimensions. But most of my discussion is going to be restricted to three dimensions, since I know that not all of you are used to n-dimensional polytopes. Okay. Uh, now, the only n-dimensional phase is, of course, the, whole, the full polytope. And so that's a flag. Okay. Now, what's the point? The point is that, for example, why is the, why is the cube a regular polytope? Well, informally, what we think of is that, is that if, we, if you move it around, it looks the same in every position, right? So first of all, how do you describe the position of a cube? In other words, if I draw for you a cube like this, and now let's say that you want to apply some transformation to it, okay? How do I specify the new position of it? Well, the first thing you would do is specify, I mean, one way of doing it is the following. I'm going to apply transformation to this polytope and to tell you where the polytope landed, where the cube landed, I tell you which vertex landed right here. There's eight possibilities. And I tell you, okay, fix it so that it's this vertex in this position. That, of course, doesn't determine it because, because now you need to know, you know there's different rotations. And so next I need to tell you which one of the three edges, which one of these three edges is going to be the one that lies horizontally like this. So the next thing I will tell you is where, is which of my edges landed here. Does that determine the, the cube? Well, it depends whether you're willing to let me turn it inside out or not, whether you let me reflect it or not. But if you let me reflect it or not, if, if you let me reflect it, then there's still two possibilities, right? That it lies like this or that it lies reflected. So I don't know if, if it's this front face or this bottom face that is facing you. And to specify that, I need to tell you what is, for example, this 
front face. And once I've told you which this point is, which this segment is, and which this face is, I've told you where the polytope is. And so that what I specify is a flag. So the position of a flag determines the position of the polytope. That's why we are interested in these. Okay. Now, why do I say that the cube is regular? Because no matter what flag I chose, the polytope looks the same. Okay. And so that's when a polytope is regular. So P is regular if, let me say it informally, if it looks the same from every from the point of view of every flag so that's how we're used to thinking informally of, of regular polytopes you move them around and they look the same now what do I what do I really mean by this mathematically what I mean is that if I now if I now specify a new flag then you can find a symmetry of the polytope that takes the polytope into itself, and it takes this flag to any specified flag. Okay. So mathematically, what I'm really saying is that there is an isometry. Now, by isometry, I just mean some transformation that doesn't distort. It just keeps the distances the same. It keeps the angles the same. There is an isometry taking any flag to any other flag. Okay. So this is really the, the mathematical definition. Okay. I should tell you that the, there are different definitions of regular polytopes that are proved to be equivalent, and, and this is one of the possibilities. Sometimes in the book you'll see a different definition. It's equivalent to this one. Now, what's a tool to think about these flags? It's something called the barycentric subdivision of P. So what is this? What you're going to do is that you're going to put a vertex at the center of each face of P. And of course, the, the next question you should ask is, what do I mean by the center of a face? Now, if the, if the polytope is regular, then it, it's probably pretty clear what I mean by center. But if it's not regular, I have to tell you. And we're going to think that this is the center of mass, yeah. or barycenter. This, if you haven't seen it in a math class, you've seen it in a physics class. It's basically the, if you try to balance the polytope, where does it balance? At the, at the barycenter. Okay. So we're going to put a vertex at the center of mass of each face of P, and this is what this picture right here is supposed to indicate. Okay. So here I have the cube, and I have placed an additional vertex on each center of mass. And I do it for every dimension. And as a visual aid, I'm going to do it in a different color in every dimension. So for example, for the, for the full dimensional polytope, I have to put a point in the center of mass of it, which is the center of the cube. And so that's this black dot. Now this thing has six faces. And so each one of these, each one of these square faces is going to have a center of mass that I'm going to draw in orange. So here's orange, orange, orange. And I didn't draw the three in the back so that it doesn't get too messy. Now this thing has, I guess, uh, how many edges? 12 edges. And in this, at the center of each edge, I have put, I have put a cyan dot. Okay. And the zero-dimensional faces are the vertices. And at each vertex, I put a purple dot. So those are the vertices of the barycentric subdivision. And now, what you're going to do is that you're going to fill in the simplex. Connecting the vertices 
of each flag. So let me show you what I mean by this. Let's consider, let's consider a flag of the cube, OK? So what's an example of a flag? I want you to look up so you see which one I'm pointing to. I'm going to consider this vertex inside this segment, inside this square, inside the whole thing. Okay. So that's a flag, and I'm going to build a tetrahedron out of it. And the way I do it is I say, OK, well, this vertex, purple, this edge, the corresponding dot is this blue dot, this face, the corresponding dot is this orange guy, and for the cube, the corresponding dot is the guy in the middle. And so I connect these two, these four points into a tetrahedron. Okay. So that looks something like that. Okay. In particular, maybe I'll add the numbers here just to be so every one of these guys, every one of these simplices is gonna have a zero vertex, a one vertex, a two vertex, and a three vertex. Right? Now, the nice thing about this, and the reason that it's called a biocentric subdivision, is that when you do this over all the possible flags, so for example, how many how many flags do I have here? Well, let's let's count them. So the number of flags of a cube is, first you specify the vertex, eight possibilities. Right? Once you specify the vertex, you have to specify the edge it's contained in. There's, there's three possibilities. So eight times three is 24. Once you specify the edge, you have to specify the face. So choose either this one or that one. So 24 times two is 48. So in this case, you have 48 flags. And if you look at how many little tetrahedra you can form like this, well, you see that I, I mean, the, the point of this picture that I drew ahead of time, of course, is that this is the barycentric subdivision. Yeah? Each one of these little triangles that you see around, connected with the origin, is going to give me a little tetrahedron. How many little triangles do I have? Well, you see I've split every square into eight little triangles. So I have 48 little tetrahedra. And so the point is that when I do this over all the possible flags, I'm going to exactly cut up the sim the, my polytope into simplices. So this is the nice fact. That these simplices subdivide my polytope. So they're exactly a, a tiling of my polytope. I've cut up my polytope into pieces, and each piece corresponds to a flag. Okay. For example, what do, what do I get when I do this for a for a hexagon? Well, basically, I have to consider these zero-dimensional guys. The one-dimensional guys are going to be the edges. And the two-dimensional thing is the whole polygon. The center of the polygon is right here. Okay. And what does a flag look like? You get to choose a vertex pointing to an edge pointing to the whole polygon. So for example, that flag that I just pointed to is vertex 2, edge 2, hexagon. Now, if you go from this one to the edge to the hexagon, you get this one. From this one to this edge to the hexagon, you get this one. And if you keep doing this, you're going to get this. And that's the barycentric subdivision of the hexagon. And of course, implicit in this is that if you start with a regular polytope, then you look the same from any flag, which means that each one of these pieces is going to look exactly the same. So if if P is regular, then they look the same. Okay. <coughs> okay. 
Yep. No, so the, there are 48 distinct tetrahedra. So let, let's look at this picture again. Um, so I took the, the square. I mean, I, I took the cube. Each square I subdivided into eight little triangles. So I have eight little triangles on the surface of, of each square for a total of 48 little triangles. But now you see this, this te uh, one tetrahedron that I outlined the only part of it that is on the outside of the polytope is, is here. And this is actually in the inside of the polytope. Yeah. So it's, I think your confusion is just a, a visual thing that this might look like it's on, on the face, but it's not. Each one of the 48 guys has a unique triangle. And so the, the 48 things exactly cover up the, the cube. Sure. So let me make an, an important observation. I'm going to basically consider this subdivision. I'm going to call the different pieces of the subdivision chambers. They look very much like the things that we have called chambers so far. So the chambers of this subdivision the chambers of the barycentric subdivision of P are exactly in correspondence with the flags of P by the bijection that I told you, where you just go from the zero vertex to the one vertex to the two vertex to the three vertex and see what flags, what faces those are. The zero phase, the one phase, the two phase, and the three phase. And by my definition of regular polytopes, if my polytope is regular, then the flags of P exactly correspond to the symmetries of the polytope. Because what, what is the symmetry of the polytope? It's, it's a way of moving it around and make it land somewhere that it looks the same. And so the original flag maps to some flag and specifies a symmetry. And so the flags are exactly in correspondence with the symmetries of my polytope. Okay. And that allows me to, to go from flags to symmetries and go into territory that we know. Okay. So what I want to do is now choose a any one of these guys and call it the fundamental chamber. And in this case, it's this one right here, right? And I want to start defining some, some symmetries of this thing, OK? Now, if you look at this, there's already three clear symmetries defined by this chamber, OK? Because this chamber is bordered by three faces. And if you look at each one of these faces, that gives me a symmetry of the cube. For example, let's look at the the reflection that fixes all vertices of C except <coughs> I, and let's call it as I. So for example, what does S0 do here. S0 is a reflection that takes this little tetrahedron and it fixes vertices 1, 2, and 3 and moves 0. So what is that? That is basically the, the reflection ac across this horizontal plane. It sends this 0 to this guy right here. And so that's clearly a symmetry of the cube. It's just a horizontal reflection by the equator. What's the reflection 1? Well, it fixes 0, 2, and 3, and it reflects 1. So
So what that does is that it fixes this diagonal plane and it reflects one across it. Okay. So it's the symmetry across this symmetry plane of the cube. Okay. Which one? It's the, the, the plane spanned by 0, 2, and 3. So it's this one right here. Okay. Reflect across there, and you get a symmetry. And finally, S2 is the guy that fixes 0, 1, and 3 and moves 2. Okay. And so that is the reflection across this plane that sends 2 over. Okay. So each one, of the facet, each one of the facets of this guy defines a reflection, which is a symmetry. P. And I call this SI. So these are symmetries of P. Or i between 0 and n minus 1. Why do I not include n? Because if you look, for example, at what S3 would do, it would be a reflection that fixes 0, 2, and 1, and moves 3, and that kicks you out of the polytope. That, that's not really a symmetry of the polytope. But the other ones are the facets of this cone center at the origin, and, and those are symmetries of the polytope. Okay. So here's a fact, key fact. The group of symmetries of P is precisely the, the Coxeter group generated by these reflections. So let me give you a, I was, I was going to prove this for you, but since we have to do the evaluations, let me just give you a, a brief sketch of why this is true. Well, the thing is that, for example, the, the reflection S1 sends this little triangle to the adjacent little triangle. S2 sends it to this triangle over here. And so the point is that ju just by using reflections across these three guys, you can send this triangle to any of these triangles over here. And that means that S0 up to Sn minus 1 generate the group. Why is it a Coxeter group? Well, because there aren't any, any, other, any other relations except for the Coxeter relations, because S0, S1, and S2 are just three independent reflections across three independent directions. Okay. So that's the hand-waving argument. Um, but so that's the fact. The fact is that if you want to understand the group of symmetries of a regular polytope, you just have to understand the Coxeter group generated by these reflections. Okay. So, for example, let's understand it in this case. Okay. What, is, what is the Coxeter group in this case? Well, I just have to figure out what are the relations between S0 and S1, S1 and S2, and S0 S2. Right. So I need to figure out what powers I need to raise these things to to get the identity. Okay. How do I do that? Well, I know that if I apply two reflections one after the other, that's just going to give me a rotation by twice the angle between the planes. So all I have to do is figure out the angle between planes 0 and 1 angle between zero between one and two and the angle between zero and two okay so for example between zero and two which which planes are these well between 0 and 2. So the, the plane that fixes 0 is this plane 1, 2, 3, which is the equator. Right? It's this guy right here. So that's plane 0. 
which one is 2? It's the guy that fixes 2 and, sorry, that fixes 0, 1, and 3 and fixes 2. So that's orange, and it looks like this. So what's the angle between those planes? It's 90 degrees, right? It's pi over 2. These things are perpendicular, which means that S0, S2 is a rotation by pi. So when you square it, you get the identity. OK? Now you do this for 1 and 2. So what's the plane 1? It's the guy that fixes 0, 2, and 3. So it looks like this. This one is a little harder to draw. It looks like this. Okay. So what's the, so this is 2. What's the angle between 0 and 2? You see it's, it's this angle right here. It's 45 degrees. Okay. Sorry, 0. No, this is this is 1. And this is 2. The angle between 0 and 1 is 45 degrees, which means that this is a rotation by pi over 2. So you need 4 of them to get the identity. And between S1 and S2, you have to stare at this a little bit to figure out what that angle is. And you'll see that that angle is pi over 3. So this is S1 and S2 cubed. That really takes some, some squinting to, to see why that angle is pi over 2. Okay. But then, given that we know what's the group of symmetries here, right? it's just a Coxeter group with these generators and these reflections. So here's 0, 1, and 2. And the order of S0 is 1 is 4. The order of S1 is 2 is 3. And the order between 0 and 2 is 2, so I don't draw that edge. And I get this, which is the Coxeter group B2, B3. OK. So given a, given a particular regular polytope, by just computing the angles between the faces of the fundamental chamber, you can figure out what the Coxeter group is. Now, let me tell you another fact, which I also was planning to prove, but I won't have the time to do it. Fact is that the angle, just the, in the notation that I have there, the angle between i and j is equal to pi over 2 for i minus j bigger than 1. So over there, the angle between planes 0 and 2 was pi over 2. And what this statement is saying is that that's no coincidence, and that really happens for any polytope, for any regular polytope. Um, as long as these guys are not consecutive, their planes are orthogonal. Okay. And I wrote a proof in the notes, so you can see it there. It's not too hard, but we don't have time to do it. But that's a very strong statement. Why? Because what am I saying? So the group of symmetries of a regular polytope is a Coxeter group. But what can we say about this Coxeter group? This Coxeter group is finite. Why is it finite? Because the, the number of elements of the, of the group is the number of symmetries of the polytope. The number of symmetries of the polytope is the number of flags. 
to a finite number. And last time we saw that actually this limits your possibilities very much. You must be a n, b n, d n, e six, e seven, e eight. What else is there? F four, h three, h four, or i two of m. For any regular polytope, the group of symmetries has to be one of these guys. That limits it very much. But you see, if, if you look at this, you're going to see that actually we have, an, we have an ordering 0, 1, 2, up to n minus 1, so that only the consecutive guys have non-trivial angles. Okay. But the angle between i and j is pi over 2 for i, big, for i bigger than j plus 1. So that means that the diagram looks like this. Between 0 and 1, you might have something interesting going on. Between 1 and 2, up to n minus 1. But there's not going to be any more edges, because only consecutive guys have non-trivial angles. Non-consecutive guys have angles pi over 2, which means that the Coxeter diagram has to be a path if it comes from a regular polytope. And that limits my possibilities even further, right? Because that tells me I could be a n, that's a path. b n is a path. But d n is not a path. e6 is not a path. This is not a path. This is not a path. And these guys are paths. So the possible Coxeter diagrams are a n, b n, okay, b n has a 4 right here. H3, F4, H4, or I2 of N. Now, let me make one last very important claim. Which is that if I know the Coxeter diagram, I actually know the polytope. Why is that? Well, I'm going to illustrate this to you very boldly by doing it for H3, seeing if I'm able to do it. Okay. Let's suppose that my polytope has diagram looking like this. Okay. Then you see what happens is that I can actually recover what the fundamental chamber looks like. It's 
think about why that is. The reason for that is that, for example, this 5 tells me that the angle between planes 0 and 1 is pi over 10. Right? So that tells me that this angle between these two planes is pi over 10. This 1 and 2 tells me that the angle between planes 1 and 2 is pi over 3. So I see that as the angle between these two planes is pi over 3. And the fact that there is nothing between 0 and 2 tells me that planes 0 and 2 are perpendicular, which means that these planes are perpendicular. And, and basically that tells me the shape of this cone. Okay. So that's the fundamental chamber. Now, I know that I can build the whole polytope from the fundamental chamber by just reflecting around across these three planes. So let's go ahead and do that. If I re this is perpendicular, right? So if I reflect this triangle over, I'm going to get this. Okay. If I reflect it over in this direction, I'm going to get something that looks like this. If I reflect this over, I'm going to get something that looks like this. This angle is pi over 10. So when I do this 10 times, I'm going to find that I'm going to exactly trace out a regular pentagon like this. Okay. Now, I can reflect over here. For example, this is another reflection. And so I can reflect this whole pentagon and get a pentagon up here. Okay. Like this. <coughs> I can reflect this pentagon over here, and I'm going to get another pentagon right here. I can reflect this pentagon over here, and I'm going to get one right here. Hopefully you see what's emerging right here. This pentagon I reflect it over, and I get one here. I can't believe this is going to work out. And this one you reflect it over, and you get something like here. And then when you reflect to the back, you get the regular dotted cohesion. Wow, that's good. Man. <laughs> Dodecahedron. Okay. And so that tells me, for example, that I do have an H3 here, and this gives me the dodecahedron. Okay. Uh, now, for example, I, I saw that this was the cube. Okay. But if you do it in higher dimensions, you might know that there's cubes of higher dimensions, and what you get here is just the n cube. This is just the simplex, the regular simplex. Now, where am I going to see the other two guys, the icosahedron and the uh, octahedron? Well, the thing is that here I started with a diagram like this. And I got the dodecahedron. If I want to get the icosahedron, I do the same thing. The only thing I do is that I start with a diagram labeled in the other direction. That's the other way of labeling it. So that 0 up to n are consecutive. And so if I like this instead, I get the icosahedron. And you can imagine that if, if I take this and I label it in the other direction, then I get something that is, in three dimensions, it's the octahedron. In higher dimensions, I have an analog of the octahedron, which is called the cross polytope. So it's a very simple polytope, and it's regular. Okay. Um, I drew a four exactly, right? The four looks like this. So we've accounted for almost everything in this picture. 
this is this is the regular m gone. Right? I've accounted for everything on this list except for these things, and I guess I also yeah f four and h four. I haven't accounted for those. Now, how do we interpret that? Well, that must mean that, or that could mean that there is some polytope that corresponding to this. What dimension does it live in? Four. One, two, three, four. And this must correspond to something else, and this must correspond to something else. Now, the good thing about this is that, as I just illustrated to you, given this diagram, you can construct the polytope. And so you do that, and you get that these things exist. This is called the 24 cell. This is called the 120 cell. This is called the 600 cell. Why don't I write, why don't I turn this one around? Because if I turn it around, I get it, I get the same thing. Okay. So that means the 24 cell is something such that the dual is itself. Okay. Um, and so that's it. That's the proof. So what are what are the regular polytopes? Well, it turns out that basically in any dimension you have a simplex, you have a cube, you have an octahedron, and then there are these weird anomalies that occur in three dimensions and in four dimensions, and that's all there is. And that's it. Okay. Tetrahedron is A3. So the simplex is like the higher dimensional version of the tetrahedron. Okay, better stop there. So, so I need a volunteer.
Thank you. 